questions that might be useful. Okay, well, let's go ahead and just get started. Um, welcome to the Mind Matters webinar series. Uh, tonight's presentation is entitled Addiction 101, Basics of Addiction and the Role of the Brain. I'm Mark Ilgen, I'm a professor and director of the University of Michigan Addiction Treatment Services, or UMATS. UMATS is located at the Rachel Upjohn Building off Plymouth Road here in Ann Arbor and is part of the Addiction Center in the Department of Psychiatry. A core part of our mission at UMATS is to, is to deliver care that is informed by research. And with this speaker series, we're hoping to share the latest research on addiction, how it helps explain how problems related to substance use arise, what makes these problems continue, and how to break out of the cycle of problematic substance use. We're aiming to deliver this series quarterly with each talk focusing on a different aspect of addiction and its treatment. Tonight's is the inaugural presentation, and as I mentioned, we're going to focus some on the, the neuroscience of addiction. Uh, I'm really pleased to welcome our speaker. Joining us is Dr. Jonathan Morrow, who's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and a practicing physician at UMATS. Dr. Morrow is a native, native Detroiter. He left us briefly to attend undergrad at the University of Southern California before returning to the University of Michigan for his MD and his PhD in neuroscience. He specializes in what's often called the treatment of co-occurring disorders. Um, that means when a substance use disorder is present along with another significant psychiatric symptom like depression or anxiety. And his research focuses on identifying uh, specific circuits in the brain that can be potentially modified to treat and or prevent problematic combinations of psychiatric and substance-related problems. Dr. Morrow, thank you for joining us. Before we begin, I want to mention that questions can be submitted in the Q&A section. Please use Q&A instead of the chat, and the Q&A is uh, there at the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll notice there's an, an option to submit questions anonymously, and you can feel free to submit them however feels most comfortable to you. After Dr. Morrow's presentation, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this presentation will be available and it'll be emailed to everyone who registered for this event. Now let's go ahead and begin. Dr. Morrow. Great, thanks. Uh, and thanks for everyone for uh, coming out to this or tuning into this as it is. Um, I do have some slides. Uh, to share. And the idea is that I'll go through this um, relatively quickly so that we can uh, have some time for questions. Uh, let's see. Oh, there we are. Okay. All right. So, uh, again, the topic here is. is the basics of addiction. So this will really be a, a, a brief overview of the, of the role of the brain in uh, what we call addiction. Um, and so when we're trying to understand the neurobiology of addiction, uh, I like to start with a very basic question. Uh, and that is, why do people use drugs? Very simply put. Uh, and if you, you know, the, the, the simplest way of trying to answer this question is just to ask people, why, are you, why do you use drugs? Um, and if you do that, you'll get a variety of answers. I have some of them up here. Um, probably the most common would be this uh, pleasure one. It's just, it's fun. It's, uh, you, get, you get some kind of satisfaction or, or pleasure from it, but there are other reasons too, maybe trying to relieve your stress or trying to basically self-treat some sort of uh, psychiatric symptom. Or maybe you're uh, trying to reach some new plane of consciousness or, or you're just curious about what, uh, what all the buzz is about. Um, 
So a variety of reasons that people will give for their drug use, but what all of these have in common is that there's some conscious goal that you're trying to reach. You're using the drugs in order to get, uh, to get some explicit goal met. Um, and this is, this is probably how most people think of, of addiction and addictive drug use. Um, and that certainly was the, the feeling in the, in the field. Uh, up until around the 50s, people started to question this uh, explanation of why people use drugs. And the reason people started to question it was, was experiments that showed uh, that animals use drugs. Um, and a lot of different animals, rats, dogs, cats, monkeys, they use uh, the same drugs that we do. They, they uh, are very uh, interested in using them. They'll, they'll use drugs to excess, even, even up to the point that it kills them. Uh, they will uh, just choose to use drugs in the same way that, that humans do. But that raises a question about some of the explanations that people give for their drug use. Is that really what's driving the drug use? Uh, it, some of these really don't make sense when you apply that to an animal. Um, and it at least raises the possibility that some non-conscious process might be involved in drug use. If, if animals are so susceptible to it, they're not, they don't have so much of these explicit goals that people do. Um, and, it, and from a neurobiological perspective, that raises the possibility that non-cortical areas might be important. Um, because the cortex is, that's what gives you these explicit conscious uh, awareness. Uh, and that's where those goals come from, is from the, the cerebral cortex. And you can see this from, uh, I'll put side by side here on the left is a human brain. And on the right is, this, this is a rat brain. Um, but other animals are, you know, you could see a similar difference where the human brain just has a whole lot of this green cortex, a lot of cortical areas. That's what makes us human in a lot of ways. We, we have this ability to think in abstract ways and explicit ways. Whereas animals, they have a cerebral cortex, but it's much smaller. And if you just threw a dart at this, uh, at this picture, saying, I don't know what, what's involved in addiction. I don't know if, if you just hit something randomly in the human brain, you probably hit cortex. Whereas in an in a animal brain, you're probably not gonna hit cortex. It just illustrates the non-cortical <clears throat> subconscious uh, processes are much stronger in animals. Um, but the addiction process just doesn't seem to be much different in them. Um, and so one, very important aspect of, of addiction, an important uh, question to answer is this one, who's really in control of this drug use behavior? Is it, so you, there, there's this tension between your explicit goals, the things that you, you uh, consciously want from yourself, for yourself and kind of subconscious drives uh, and people have been aware of this kind of tension for a long time. There's, a, there's an ancient metaphor of the charioteer. Uh, ancient Greeks use this, this metaphor for this, where you can think of the horses as these kind of subconscious urges and the charioteer as your conscious self. Uh, and the question here is who's really in control of the, of the chariot? Is it the charioteer? Well, yeah, you can certainly make an argument for that because if he pulls the reins right, the chair is going to go right. If he pulls the reins left, it'll go left. Um, so he's very much in control of that of that chariot. But at the same time, if the horses don't decide not to listen to him, I mean, the chariot is going to go where the horses pull it. They're ultimately in control here. Um, so you can really argue either way. And 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 actually, this is why um, elephants were so. Uh, useful in, in ancient combat is because horses were are, they're afraid of elephants 
it doesn't matter how well trained they are that the, the, the ch they're going to pull a chariot away from an elephant it doesn't matter what the charioteer wants um and our brains are kind of set up in a similar way we like to think that we are totally in control of our behavior at all times we like to think that we're making conscious decisions about everything um, but in reality most of what we do is subconscious no, it's, it's a non-conscious process we're on automatic pilot and our conscious self only kind of pops in to make decision we kind of pay attention to what we're doing and say oh yes i agree with this let's keep doing it or wait we should be doing something different um that's about five percent of the time really that we're that we're in control like that um and so an analogy, one kind of analogy that I like to use is, is breathing. So I'm totally in control of my breathing, right? I can breathe in anytime I want. I can breathe out. I can stop breathing. But uh, if I decide to stop breathing for five minutes, then my brainstem <laughs> is going to take over. At that point, and I'm, and it's going to make me breathe. I'm just going to have this desire to breathe that gets so strong that I cannot, uh, I can't overcome that. Um, so you're, you're kind of in control until you're not. And the, over the course of addiction, what happens is it's a great, it's a, it's a loss of control, where these kind of subconscious processes take over, even though the person may tell you or tell themselves. That they're still in control we like i say we want we really really want to believe that we're in control and so one of the big challenges in the in treating uh, addiction is convincing people that they're not in control at least not, they're not in control anymore of this of this uh, substance use um and this this is a challenge because this is, it, it's kind of like this guy here. Uh, I'm coming in, he, you know, he's, he's very happy. He's turning the wheel, he's, you know, he's, he's driving the car, right? The last thing he wants to hear is for me to come in and say, well, you know, that, that steering wheel isn't really connected to anything. You're not, you're not really controlling the car. His response is gonna be, no, get out of here. <laughs> I'm driving here, you're distracting me. I say, well, you know, the, the drive shaft is way over here. No, he doesn't want to hear it. He'll say, you're going to make me crash. Uh, so it's, it's just not a welcome message, but it's, but it's something to, to get the, to understand what's happening to them and to really get it under control. They have to realize that they're, they're not in conscious control of this, at least not totally anymore. So neurobiologically, how does this happen? How do drugs make the, the brain switch so that uh, this, this, your conscious self is not totally in control of that, of that substance use anymore. Well, the, the, there's a lot that's been learned about the neurobiology of addiction. Probably the most uh, prominent thing that, that comes up in, in, in the addiction neurobiology is that all drugs of abuse will release dopamine in an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. This is a non-cortical area, it's, kind of, it's very deep in the brain. Um, and this, this happens with all addictive substance. They really have nothing in common with each other, um, it, it, bi biologically, chemically, they're, they're just totally different molecules, um, except that one way or another, they all increase dopamine release in this area called the nucleus accumbens. Some of them do it very directly, like cocaine. Um, others, like opioids, you have to inhibit one set of neurons that then disinhibits another set of neurons. But the end result is they all increase dopamine into this company. So other types of rewards will also increase dopamine in that same area. And uh, normally it's, it's natural reinforcers like food, or sex or, or you know water if you're thirsty even a good lecture if you're interested into it um, that will release dopamine 
And the function of that is to, is to basically make you want to do that thing again. Now, normally, uh, the way this functions is act, you, you engage in some activity, you meet some goal that you had for yourself. It could be as simple as, you know, I wanted to taste something good, but that, you know, that kind of satisfaction that causes pleasure, the pleasure then causes dopamine release. And that dopamine causes a desire to repeat that activity again. With drugs of abuse, this becomes pathological because the drugs directly release dopamine. And so that desire to use is gonna be there regardless of the consequences of that drug use, whether it, made, whether it reached whatever goal you had for, your, for, for that drug use or not, it's still gonna release dopamine and you're still gonna to wanna to do it again. And I guess I should say here, if people think of dopamine as a pleasure molecule. It's certainly related to pleasure, but it's, it's much more of a motivational molecule. Pleasure is actually mediated a, a bit differently. So, um, so that, that's very basically what these drugs do. Is they increase dopamine in the accumbens. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the nucleus accumbens does. So the nucleus accumbens functions within a larger circuit that I'm not gonna th go through in a lot of detail. But the purpose of this circuit is to tie perceptions and emotions to behavior. It's kind of a translator where it takes the perceptions and emotions that you have, and then it translates that into behavior. And so if you have a, a, a stimulus or a cue or something that you encounter, that gets processed on different levels uh, within this circuit. And so there's different types of calculations that are going. So, so on the first level, for example, you, you may see a, a beer bottle. So on the first level, you would process that as recognizing, oh, this is a beer bottle. And then that gets passed on to the second level where it would say, well, it, it attaches emotions and memories to that. So the last time I saw that, I was at a party, I was with my friends, I was having a good time. Um, and then the next level is where the nucleus accumbens comes in. That's where you're making a decision about what to do. So I see this beer bottle. So am I going to drink it or not? That's where the nucleus accumbens comes in. And then whatever decision you make, that gets passed on to the, to the final level here, where, you're, where it goes to the motor, motor cortex and other things where you're, you're preparing uh, you're preparing for whatever action it is you decided to take. You're, you're starting that action and getting the body ready for it. So if you add dopamine into the system, particularly at the nucleus accumbens, what that does is it binds all of these together, all of those associations and those decisions all get stronger such that the next time you encounter that beer bottle, you're gonna be more likely to have the same emotions and memories come up. You're more, more likely to make the same decision and you'll have the same outcome. And in the case of addictive drugs, every time you do that, you get a dopamine release. So every time you use the drug, then you, when you're in that situation again, you're gonna be more likely to use it again. Again, regardless of the consequences. Even if it's the worst night of your life, you're still getting dopamine release. I think of a, there's a, I guess it's a little dated now, but there, there's, a, there's a Katy Perry song called Last Friday Night. Um, and if you listen, it's a very upbeat, poppy song. But if you listen to the lyrics of the song, it's basically about a, a night of binge drinking. And she describes this night where, she, where she's, you know, she gets blacked out drunk, She's vomiting on herself. She's sexually assaulted. She has criminal charges. Uh, and the refrain of that song is, next Friday night, do it all again. And, the, and if you just take the alcohol out of the picture, that, that's a terrible experience. <laughs> but she wants to do it all again because she drank alcohol. And that directly releases dopamine. And so that's going to make you want to do whatever it was. It's going to make you want to do it again.
That's what makes this drug use pathological. And that gets stronger as you use the drugs more and more. Uh, and so to illustrate that, I'll show you this, this, um, this phenomenon called sensitization of the dopamine response. So this graph here is a measurement, a fairly direct measurement of dopamine in response to a drug. So this is in the nucleus accumbens, you have this level of dopamine. This is in an animal. So the animal got an amphetamine injection. And so there's two groups. There's this group in, in black and there's a group in, in white here. And so in the white group, they got amphetamine. You, you see this big dopamine increase that then goes down. In black, they got the same dose of amphetamine, but the difference is in the white group, that was their first time getting amphetamine. In the black group, this is their sixth time getting amphetamine. And you see the increase in dopamine is higher. And if it was their seventh time, it would be higher. If it was their 10th time, it would be even higher. Every time they use, they get a stronger and stronger dopamine release. So what that translates to is this, the, it's, a, it's a desire, that's a motivational signal. So their desire to repeat that experience is getting stronger and stronger every time they use that drug. Now this is in contrast with a lot of other effects of drugs where you get tolerant to it. That's kind of the opposite of, of sensitization. Pleasure is one of those things that you get tolerant to. So, so it's a, this is a characteristic of addiction with repeated drug use the desire to use, the craving increases, but the pleasure decreases to the point where in late stages of addiction, I hear people say all the time, I don't even, I don't even like this anymore. I don't understand why, why I keep doing this. Well, this is why. It's because dopamine is increasing, but your pleasure is not. Yeah, that's actually decreasing. It has nothing to do with your conscious desire to use. Uh, so another aspect that's kind of relevant to treatment is, is the timing of the dopamine release. It's essentially a learning signal because, like I said, it's tying this experience with the dopamine release. So the faster you get that dopamine release, the more likely you're going to have this kind of addictive behavior. Um, and you can see this with different routes of, uh, of, of drug. You can do this with really any drug, but inhaling something gives you the, the dopamine release within a few seconds. Um, whereas if you eat it, then it has to go through the digestive system and it takes half hour to an hour uh, before you get the effects of that drug. Well, for example, so any drug that you're smoking is going to be more. It's going to be more addictive if you're smoking it than if you're eating it. You can see this with cocaine, crack cocaine, extremely addictive. But chewing coca leaves, like they do in the Andes, that's less. That's much less addictive. And it's because you have this long time period here between when you use the drug and when you got the dopamine release. Your subconscious brain can't put that together as well and say, well. What was it that produced this dopamine release? It gets confused, and so, and so it, it doesn't know what, you did a lot of things in between, so it doesn't know what to reinforce there. Whereas with crack cocaine, you're getting the dopamine, you've still got the, the crack pipe in your mouth. So it knows exactly what got you that, that dopamine release, so you're gonna be, have a very strong desire to do that again. Um, now, there's some drugs to treat addiction that, that uh, take advantage of that. Um, this is things like buprenorphine or nicotine patches, nicotine replacement therapies. These have long acting effects. And so they spread out that dopamine release over time, which effectively weakens that connection between the drug use and the dopamine release. So um, it prevents those, those kinds of addictive behaviors. These are some of the, the most useful interventions that we have to, to treat addiction. Um, now, another aspect to point out is, to this kind of dopamine response is that stress will sensitize the dopamine response, just like repeated drug use is sensitized. So stress will sensitize it as well. So I'll show that here with another graph of uh, this is dopamine release in the, in the accumbens again, two groups of animals again, 
one of them gets uh, the, in gray, gets cocaine this time. And you see the dopamine increases with that cocaine. In blue is also getting cocaine. Uh, and it's also the same dose as for the first time. The difference between these groups is the ones in blue have been stressed just a little bit. It's not, a, it's not like a traumatic stress, but it's just, just kind of messing with them. We, we tilt the cage or get them wet or um, make it cold in there or something like that. Um, and that type of stress, you see what happens with the dopamine response. It's earlier, it lasts longer, they get this stronger dopamine response when they're under stress. This is why stress is a major cause of relapse uh, in addiction. Um, and this is why treating things like depression, anxiety, and other things are very important for recovery because you want you have to reduce that stress in order to prevent uh, relapse. Now, a lot of times, treatment will involve punishing essentially the the use, telling somebody that you know, why are you so uh, why are you doing this to us and things like that. Very ineffective way of treating addiction. It, it, in fact, it probably makes things worse because it's just increasing the stress level. What, what works a lot better is rewarding sobriety, making that a rewarding choice. That actually releases dopamine to counter uh, the, the drug use. Much more effective uh, way. Uh, so a, a little bit more about what exactly dopamine is doing within this system. So dopamine I said is, is strengthening those connections. It, it's, it's physically doing that. It's strengthening connections between neurons uh, when, it, when it's released in the, in the accumbens here. Um, and so when, you, when, you, when a drug is used, you get, uh, the, the dopamine will selectively, it will, it will specifically strengthen those synapses that are active right before that dopamine uh, was released. So that's all gonna be stuff that's related to the drug use, especially if that was recent. Um, and at the same time, it's weakening synapses that were not active just then. So this is why the, in the course of addiction, they actually lose interest in things that used to be motivating for them. Things like their job, hobbies, family, all of that actually loses motivational value uh, and the drug gains motivational value because, because it's, it's strengthening those synapses and weakening the others. You can reverse that to a certain degree by engaging in healthy activities, um, things that are rewarding, things that are fulfilling for the individual that are meaningful. Those also release dopamine. So what that will do is strengthen those synapses um, related to the healthy activities. And at the same time, they'll weaken a little bit those uh, synapses related to drug use. So the more you can engage in those kinds of activities, that's gonna help reverse some of the process of addiction. And that's why I tell people, you know, finding meaning and fulfillment and sobriety, that's a central challenge in, in addiction. Uh, if somebody says they wanna quit drinking, I'm gonna ask them, what are you gonna do instead of drinking? Are you just gonna sit there and not drink? <laughs> that's not gonna work very well. You have to find something else that's gonna be meaningful for you to, to compete against that drinking, basically. You have to make a real change. Like, this is something I like to say, if you wanna change your life, you have to change your life. You have to do something different, very different uh, to overcome that addiction. Uh, so one other thing that I want to point out just before we, because I, I focused a lot on the subcortical cortical areas, the nucleus accumbens, there are other areas that are involved in addiction. And a big one is the prefrontal cortex. This is a part of the, on this uh, chart here, this is the orbital frontal cortex, which is a part of the uh, prefrontal. Um, substance use will damage these areas, these, these prefrontal cortical areas. These are the parts that are, you, basically, we call that executive control. This is your conscious self. That's where that comes from. And this is what gives you self-control, essentially. That, that's what puts the brakes on 
your subcortical urges, the things coming from the nucleus that comes that say use drugs or do whatever kind of crazy thing that you that you want to do, your your prefrontal is going to say, well, is this is this the right time for that? Does that actually is that actually compatible with my long term goals? Um, that's what you use to control uh, inappropriate drug use, and you can see this is an this is a person who has not been using drugs and you can see they're engaged in a task that's using their prefrontal a lot. This is somebody who's been using cocaine, doing the same task, they're not able to engage that area, not nearly as much. And this is true with all drugs of abuse to varying degrees, they will weaken that control that people have over their behavior. And this is something that we, um, this is something that we can address in therapy. A lot of what the therapy we do is focus on strengthening that cortical control. It's basically exercising that part of your brain to gain more control over those urges to use. And so a couple of examples of that. One is just talking about the urges. If you, if you want to drink, then let, let's say that out loud. Let's talk about that. Just the act of talking engages these cortical areas. Right? Rats can't talk, lizards can't talk, people talk. That's part of that. And so if you, if you do that, you're engaged, you're, you're literally inc including that part of your brain in the conversation. And so at least it has a chance of overcoming those, um, those urges. Another one is, is talking about the, the future consequences. We call that playing the tape forward. So if I drink, what's gonna happen? Well, I'll feel better about whatever, you know, I'll, I'll reach wherever I go. So then what? Well, then I'll probably have another drink because I always do. Then what? Well, then I'm going to be in trouble because my wife didn't want me. I'm probably going to get in trouble at work and I'm going to be hung over. Eh, maybe I don't want to drink anymore. So, uh, but just that process of looking into the future and that's something that you have to use your prefrontal cortex in order to do. Again, that's something that makes us human. We can see the future. Animals can't do that nearly as well. Um, and just doing that, again, makes that part of yourself part of that conversation. It exercises that part of your brain so that you can gain more control over these uh, subcortical areas that are really just taking over your mind at that point. Um, so like I said, this was gonna be a very brief, I wanna have time, have Plenty of time for questions. So, um, so I'll leave you with a few takeaways. Uh, if you have been asleep, you can wake up and just take take these few things away from from what I said. Uh, one is that addictive drugs will directly, neurobiologically, increase the desire for drug use, regardless of its consequences. It doesn't matter whether it's re reaching your goals, whether you really want to do that or not. The drugs bypass all of that and directly make you want to use more drugs. Um, managing stress is critical for preventing relapse. Learning to manage that, um, reduce stress, avoid stress, but, but you're gonna have some stress. You have to learn to manage stress in order to reduce those kind of urges uh, to use drugs. Engaging in meaningful, fulfilling activities can reverse some of this neurobiological addictive process and weaken the hold that addictive drugs have over, over behavior. Um, and you have to do that because the normal self-control systems are compromised by drug use. So that's something that, that in therapy, we try to reverse. There's a, there's a lot of different exercises that we can do to try to reverse that process. Uh, so the last slide here, um, if you are having trouble with addiction, you need help with that, great place to, to start is your primary care provider. So just go to your doctor. They should be able to make appropriate referrals. This is a, this is a medical condition. So get the referrals to get the help that you need. Um, and you can also do that yourself. Uh, you can look for uh, treatment or recovery programs. There's a website um, through our uh, University of Michigan's Addiction uh, Center that has lots of resources on it. Um, and there's also a national one um, that you can access as well. 
look into medication treatments. There are medications available that can help with alcohol and other drug uh, problems. They, as I said, they're very effective, the ones that we have. Um, take your medications as prescribed, do your therapy, do support appointments. Um, if, you're, if you're in treatment, um, they're very helpful. We have experts who know that they have experience with this or listen to the people who know what they're talking about <laughs> uh, to get it under control. Um, all right, but let's, uh, I will stop here with the slides and I am happy to take whatever questions people may have. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. I really appreciate the presentation. And um, I, I have one just um, general question. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really helpful to see the, the biology of addiction and it, and it reinforces that message that this is not a moral failing. This is, a, as you said, a medical biological condition. Um, but that it could also maybe be a double edged sword for some people where um, then it feels like not only do they have to overcome the, the things in their life that are challenging, but now they have this um, physiological uh, challenge of addiction and it could make it feel almost harder to turn things around. How do you deal with that when someone brings that up? How do you acknowledge the biology, but also um, make sure that that's, um, you know, not an impediment to feeling hopeful or, or um, sensing the ability to make change? Well, well, I, I try to point out that that addiction can get better. You know, that we, we have treatments that are effective for addiction. Um, and so we, if we have effective treatments, this is something that you have some control over. Um, and so if you, if you follow the, um, if you follow the recommendations, then we can expect that it, that condition to improve. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's not unlike a lot of other medical issues that you have. They, they can, they can seem overwhelming, but it's not an incurable, well, it's not, it's not an untreatable disorder, okay? We, we have interventions that can help with it. Um, so yeah, that, I, I'd say that's the main message, yeah. Wonderful, and then um, as a question from the chat, what, what explains um, differing levels of susceptibility uh, to addiction? So uh, I guess, not all rats would respond the same. How do you understand that? And how's that fit in with what you described? So yeah, it's a great question. This is um, a very active area of research. Uh, that's, that's the main question of my, <laughs> of my research. So I, uh, I think I'd be out of a job if I had, if I had the perfect answer for that. <laughs> but, uh, but I can say generally that there are, there's, there's multiple, components to, to, the, to this variation. So some people are definitely more prone to, to addiction than others. Some of that is genetic. And depending on the drug, the specific drug, it seems to be about 50% of that is, is, is genetic. Uh, it just runs in families that some people are more susceptible. The other 50% of that is environmental. Um, and that can have to do with you know, the, the experiences that you've had, particularly in childhood, um, a lot of childhood stress can make people more vulnerable to these, uh, to these disorders. Um, but there's also things as simple as just, you know, how, how available were drugs uh, in your life? How was that modeled with, your, with the peers that you were with? All of those things can, can influence how susceptible uh, a given person is to, to substance use. And a question about relapse, um, again, from the, the Q&A, um, this person describes a loved one who um, went through treatment, was doing well for a number of years, but then relapsed. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process of relapse and, and especially how that's possible after such a long period when things were clearly doing so much better? Yeah, so it was, so this is kind of belied by, I, I kind of misspoke earlier when I said it's not, it's not incurable. So we, we actually don't have a cure for addiction. It's, 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 a, it's a chronic illness. It's, it's, a, it's a lifelong thing. It's, uh, it's uh, I mean, the, the 
often the analogy is with is with diabetes or something. It's uh, it's something that it's certainly treatable, um, but it, it's not curable. It doesn't go away. Even when someone hasn't been using for years and years, their brain has been altered by that substance use. And so you can put, um, you, can, you can take action to reverse that partially. You can um, try to, there's lots of things you can do to try to prevent relapse, but the, the possibility is always there. So you have to be vigilant with that. And some of the things that can trigger relapse after a long time are some of the things that I mentioned, like being in an especially stressful situation, that's gonna make those kind of uh, urges more difficult to, to overcome. And there's cues, there's multiple things that you encounter that become associated with drug use, some of which you know uh, consciously, you know that that's, that that's associated with the drug. Some of it you may not know consciously. It's a subconscious connection with the drug. Maybe you run into somebody that you just recognize and you had, maybe there was a commercial that was playing, who knows what it is. But if you encounter that, even years after the fact, this is such a strong experience that can trigger this craving all over again. And it can lead to relapse. I mean, there's other paths, away, paths to do that too. I think part of the issue is that sometimes people will think that they don't have an addiction anymore <laughs> or convince themselves that they're, or maybe it's their subconscious telling them in order to ultimately use drugs, hey, this isn't a problem. Why don't you just try another one? Uh, but you still do have an addiction, so you're still susceptible to a relapse like that. But yeah. And a similar question um, asking specifically about the prefrontal cortex, and, and I'm guessing that slide you showed with the real difference between someone who would, I think in that case, use cocaine and someone who hadn't. Um, are those effects reversible and does it change over time? And, and how does that impact motivation? Yeah, so um, it's partially reversible. So it's, I mean, essentially this is, this is brain damage. And brain damage is, uh, the brain doesn't, doesn't change a lot, <laughs> okay? It's just one of those things where uh, recovery, that we, there is plasticity within the brain, but not as much as you would get in other parts of your body. So, um, but as I said, you, it, it does respond to experience. And, and, and so if you, if you shape the experiences that your brain is having, you can partially reverse this. This, this is, like I said, something that we do in therapy where we exercise that part of the brain. Um, it can be a real challenge with, with severe addiction though, because I mean, those pathways that you're trying to exercise are really been damaged. Um, but, it, but it's something that we can, we can certainly do, uh, basically rehabilitate. Well, I guess, the, I guess we do call it rehabilitation. It's very much like physical rehabilitation where we can get some of that function back uh, with exercise. Great. The next question is about um, treating co-occurring disorders like depression or anxiety. So uh, the, um, the question points out there are new and effective treatments for depression and anxiety, um, such as uh, new brain stimulation. And I think this question also probably holds true for um, some of the uh, longstanding treatments that have been out there for those conditions. How do they... Um, affect addiction and, and do they change some of the processes that you talked about that might lead to relapse? Yeah, it's an it's a excellent question. So um, most of those treatments are going to kind of indirectly affect addiction in the sense that if you so, say you have a, a, a bad depression, if you treat that depression, then you're, that's gonna reduce the stress levels, it's gonna, and it's gonna make uh, sobriety just more, it's more easily uh, attained um, because you're not under stress you, you, and the, the urges aren't gonna be as strong. Uh, conversely, if you don't <laughs> treat that, then there's, there's a, is, you just have huge triggers for, I mean, so for some people that is a trigger for relapse, actually for a lot of people that is, one of the one of the cues essentially is just this bad feeling. They've used drugs 
and associated drugs with that bad feeling so much that that actually is now a very strong cue for them. So if, if they're just constantly bombarded by that, by this untreated depression, that's going to be a, it's going to be very difficult to achieve sobriety under those under those circumstances. So um, pretty much any psychiatric disorder, you really want to treat that along with an addiction, um, and uh, because they're going they interact with each other. Each one makes the other one worse. So you want to treat those at the same time because they're so interrelated. It's almost well, not impossible. It's 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 much more difficult to get one under under control if you're just ignoring with this, this other disorder. So yeah. Thanks. And uh, um, a, sp a specific question here related to Suboxone, and uh, the question is about the impact of um, uh, Suboxone on dopamine release. But maybe you could just talk briefly. Um, about what is Suboxone, is it helpful, is there evidence behind it, and then also touch on um, how it might relate to dopamine. Sure, yeah, so, so Suboxone, is, that's a brand name for, for a combination of buprenorphine and, and naloxone. So, so, and the naloxone, we don't get into the naloxone, but the, but the buprenorphine is, that's, that's used as a treatment for opioid use disorder. So buprenorphine is an opioid, um, like heroin or Oxycontin or, uh, well, I guess you know, hydromorphone, <laughs> you know, with these other uh, opioids that people abuse. The difference, one of, one of the big differences with buprenorphine is that it has a longer half-life, which means it's going to take longer for those brain levels to increase, and it's going to take longer for them to decrease. Um, that will essentially decouple the dopamine release from the act of using the drug. So that actually weakens that connection between those two behaviors. So you don't get the same sorts of, you, you can get addictive behavior to buprenorphine, but much less than with heroin or something that's, that's so much quicker on and off. Um, and it is very effective. It is I mean, it's, it's really the most, certainly for opioid use disorder, that is the most effective intervention that we have. It will reduce relapse rates by 50% or so. Um, it'll reduce deaths by 50%. It'll increase employment. It'll decrease uh, prison and all, you know, basically any kind of bad outcome you can have from an opioid use disorder, that's gonna improve by about 50%. Uh, when people are on uh, buprenorphine or a similar um, drug, so very effective. It's not. It's not entirely known why <laughs> that it is effective. I, should, I shouldn't say that as if this is totally settled science, but but that's probably why it though is doing this because of that very long half life that decouples that um, that kind of learning signal from the dopamine. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. And. Um... Just to point out, there are a lot of questions coming in, which is terrific. Uh, with 10 minutes left, we're probably not going to get through them all. However, we will um, try to respond to the questions after the, um, the presentation here. And if uh, you put them in the, the question and answer, we'll, we'll try and get uh, answers out to you. So don't hold back. Please keep the questions coming, even if uh, we don't get through them all. Um, the, the next question is a broader um, inquiry about just how you have the conversation with someone that where you can see they're no longer in control of their addiction, but uh, maybe the person themselves doesn't see it. What's the best way to convince them that they may have lost the control? Uh, yeah, it's a, it, that, that, it's, it's a tough question, <laughs> honestly, because those, those can be contentious uh, conversations sometimes. Um, but it's important to have the conversation, to bring it up uh, with the person. Um, and the most effective ways are to try to get the person talking about it themselves. Um, because if, if you're having a conversation with, uh, I mean, I'm going to listen more to myself than I'm going to listen to you. <laughs> uh, if nothing else, because my voice is louder in my own head <laughs> than yours is. Um, and so that's both both literally and metaphorically. So get them talking about um, 
things that might be going wrong in their life. And that might get them to make that connection with the, with the drug use. Um, and even if you're getting a lot of pushback, just bring it up again <laughs> and bring it up again and bring it up again. Because if you have that conversation repeatedly over time, eventually that person might come to an understanding themselves uh, and, and go to get help. It's, it's a very difficult thing, but it, they, they really have to come to it themselves for, to, to, in order to really make a change there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the next question is about 12-step programs. Uh, the most widely available treatment programs rely exclusively on 12-step programs. How effective are these? Uh, that's a tough, so the, the short answer is we don't know. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's difficult to study those because, you know, AA is Alcoholics Anonymous. So uh, the anonymous nature makes it difficult to do kind of randomize the, the kind of the gold standard controls that we have. We do know that there's a type of therapy called 12-step facilitation where we kind of encourage people and support people in their AA, that you can randomize. That's quite effective um, at, at, at treating substance uh, use. Um, but I kind of liken it to, uh, if, if with the analogy of, of diabetes, to, to Weight Watchers, okay? So Weight Watchers is good. It helps with diabetes, but it's not a medical treatment. <laughs> so... Uh, so the, the best intervention is, is really a combination of these kind of peer support things with a, a more kind of science-based uh, approach to it. But, but we, we definitely encourage most people to, to get involved in AA because it gives a lot of peer support and that's, that's, that has been shown to be helpful with, with addiction. Yeah. Great. And there's a question here just specifically on um, recommendations for uh, a book on the biology of addiction. Is, is there something that you would recommend uh, for reading on this topic? Uh, hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Uh, yeah, it's tough because I, you know, the, the ones I read are probably not appropriate to recommend. <laughs> uh, you know, I, let, let, that might be a good one to uh, send out. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Um, okay, so let's, this is a little bit of a longer question, but I'm just going to read it to you. Um, cocaine is refined, highly concentrated substance, whereas coca is a naturally occurring plant with mild stimulant properties. People in the Andes chew it uh, in a way that we might drink coffee. So to compare um, sniffing cocaine uh, with chewing the others is really apples to oranges. Um, so I, I think this is maybe about the, the comment around root of administration and um, uh, the addictive, the level of addictiveness with substance. Um, is, are there other examples where you can um, look to, to understand the mm -hmm. importance of root of administration? Uh, almost all of them, honestly, uh, almost all substances of abuse. They're, they're, most of them are naturally occurring substances, or at least some kind of modification of a naturally occurring substance. And they've been used for thousands of years without a lot of addiction problems. Part of that is there's a whole cultural structure that's been around, all, all of which is lost in modern, certainly in modern America, um, that limits the drug use. But also we've extracted the, the, the key ingredient, we purified it, crystallized it, and put it in a needle that we can just shoot directly into our vein, that's gonna be more addictive <laughs> no matter what the substance is. Uh, we're seeing that now with, with things like uh, Kratom or Kratom that people call. This, is, this, is, this has been used for a long time. Now, the way we're getting it in America is in this refined substance that's uh, very purified and you, you can snort it or whatever. That's causing problems in a way that it didn't traditionally. And like I say, even with alcohol, alcohol became a much bigger problem when we learned distillation. <laughs> and so we have these, you know, hard alcohol. Uh, it's just different from the, from the naturally occurring substances. So, yeah. And on a somewhat uh, similar, or in a somewhat similar vein, 
uh, questions about marijuana, which you often hear um, people talking about it, you know, it's natural and th that's different than um, some other substances. Um, can you talk a little bit about marijuana? Um, how does it function? Does it have similar properties to what you described or are they different? And then maybe also mention um, the impact on anxiety and mood because some a lot of people report they use marijuana to manage their anxiety and mood. Is mm -hmm. that helping? Does that make the addiction worse? Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure, yeah. So, uh, but I'll keep it brief. So, 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 so marijuana is, um, so it is addictive. It's, it's, it does cause dopamine release in the accumbens kind of indirectly, but it, but it does, it does that same process. It's less addictive than other substances in the sense that um, a lower percentage of people who use marijuana will actually become addicted to marijuana. I think it's around 8% is the estimate. You can certainly argue with that with how you measure how addictive something is. But um, as opposed to alcohol, which is more like 12% or, or heroin, which is like 25% or something like that. Um, so it's less addictive. But if you have an addiction to marijuana, it can be just as destructive on your life. You can have a severe addiction to marijuana that ruins your career. I've seen people lose their lose custody of their children because they just can't stop using this substance. Um, so it's, it's, this, it's the same process can happen. It's just less likely to happen with that drug than with, than with other drugs. Um, it's uh, and, I'll, and I'll also say, that what we talked about kind of refining. The marijuana today is much, much more potent than it was in the past. This is, this is genetically engineered to have, what is, I think it's like 10 times more marijuana than the, than the, the natural plant. Um, so it's, it's not really natural anymore. <laughs> it's becoming less natural over time. There's also these new ways of using it that make it more addictive. So. Um, but to the other, the other aspect with the anxiety, it definitely reduces anxiety for most people. Some people actually increases anxiety, it, but it will reduce anxiety when people are intoxicated on it. The problem is you get tolerant to that pretty quickly, and then the anxiety shoots up to a, to a higher level than it was before you were smoking. So people get into a cycle where they're using marijuana to treat their anxiety, but what they're really treating mostly is cannabis withdrawal. Um, you see the same cycle with alcohol. Alcohol also reduces anxiety, but it's not a good, it's not a good treatment for anxiety because you get that tolerance cycle very quickly that where then you, you've just created a new problem for yourself essentially. Um, so we, we have other treatments for anxiety that don't, that don't have that same kind of problem. Yeah. Wonderful. That's a very helpful answer. And we're almost at the eight o'clock hour. Um, thank you, everyone, for inputting questions. They're coming in faster than I can keep track of them right now, which is really exciting and, and um, good to see. And, and we appreciate you uh, being this engaged. Um, in general, we hope that you and the audience found, um, found the information to be helpful. And uh, as we point out, there should be um, information in the chat in terms of ways to find help, how to contact um, us here at the U of M and um, more information about uh, programs that are available. Um, our next session will be March 9th at 7 p.m. And at that point in time, we'll, we'll cover the topic of treatment, focusing on different treatment options that are available. Um, the, I wanna make sure I note that the educational series has been made possible by a generous gift from the Patrick Gibbons Memorial Fund, which honors the memory of Dr. Gibbons, who was a passionate doctor who helped many people in the pursuit of recovery from addiction. And I think many people in uh, really throughout Southeast Michigan um, know Dr. Gibbons and, and benefited directly and indirectly from him. I wanna thank Dr. Morrow and thank all of you for attending. And we hope to see you again at a future presentation. Take care. Thanks.